thanks for um, inviting me to talk. I'm uh, grateful and, and uh, it's been really interesting listening to all these other things. I think um, I've learnt an enormous amount from what we've heard today. Anyway, I'll give you a brief um, indication of how we've started out and uh, where we are now and why we think it's vital to um, fully develop and, uh, and the economic and, and environmental sustainability of a property like that. We um, started out with a family business in 1966 and uh, with um, my parents and, uh, and myself. We purchased a small property at Canamble, about 3,000 acres of um, country in northwest New South Wales, if anyone doesn't know. And um, it was very run down. We ran that uh, for about three years, and, um, which was um, hopeless, really. And um, we were really going backwards. And we realised we had to get in and develop it, water it, fence it, and sow it down. So we, um, we actually sowed it all down to loosened country. And to keep the loosen alive, we used a, a rotation. And uh, so we put in 30 paddocks and, um, of about 100 acres. And that turned out to, uh, and, and we just fattened cattle on it. That was, um, it became profitable. It was very simple to run. We could virtually run it in about a day a week. And it formed a, a sort of a template for how we operate. Um, we expanded a bit around the district. I'll go into that a little bit more in a minute. But, um, and we ended up moving and, and selling out in that area and, and moving into uh, western Queensland, at, um, south of Longreach. And uh, did more or less the same thing there. We, we had a, a pretty handy place there and we ended up um, selling that off as well. And then so we bought country in uh, Western Australia. Um, in the Kimberley region and uh, we bought um, some country down at Holbrook which is uh, just up the road from here and uh, we end up selling that and, and purchasing uh, country on King Island and all the time we had the country in the north so we, um, we were working from sort of two ends of the con a bit but uh, that worked alright. In um, 2002 we sold the, uh, the land we had on King Island and the property we had in the Kimberleys um, to buy this uh, place uh, where we are now. And uh, so the present property is on the, um, northern, in the Northern Territory on the Barclay Tablelands. It's about 800 k's um, south of Darwin, about 800 k's north of Alice and uh, about 800 k's west of Mount Isa. So it's uh, pretty central to somewhere, not quite sure where. <laughs> um, we, uh, I'll just give you another slide to show you that it's a scene. Um, it's a mixture of open treeless country, it's, uh, which would make up about 20-25% of the place, which is basically Mitchell Flindergrass country. Um, it uh, about 30% would be Coolabar flood out country, which is basically, um, you know, at this time of the year we've got a very wet season up there, and, and so um, it would be sort of uh, flood water 30 k's wide and about six inches deep and very slow moving. If you uh, chucked a leaf into it, it wouldn't go one way or the other, it just literally soaks off that country so uh, it'll hang around there probably for another six weeks as it as, as it moves off us. The balance of the country is um, a red savannah bush country. Um, it goes from lightly timbered country to pretty thick scrub. About eight percent of the place is, uh, is very thick um, a sandalwood scrub and, uh, and I mean thick, you flat out to open a pocket knife in it. But surprisingly enough the stock spend a fair bit of time in that country and interestingly enough not a drop of water, doesn't matter how much it rains, ever runs off it. It just disappears into it and um, we'd never be game to touch it because 
or you have a sneaking feeling it's probably recharging our aquifers up there, which are uh, absolutely critical to us. We purchased this place, uh, it's a, a million and fifty thousand hectares, about 2.6 million acres. It was running about um, 20,000 cattle when we purchased it and had 40 waters on it. Now we believe that water affects around about 4,000 acres and um, we normally would put a, a beast to about two, uh, 20 acres so we would have suggested that place could run um, around about 8,000 cattle. So it was overstocked before we got there and uh, I'll show you a little bit about that when we get a bit further on. Um, basically, our, our business is just growing grass and then converting that grass into a product we sell. If we don't have any grass, we don't have any product and we don't have a business. So um, you just you can't emphasise you know, the strength of our business is the grass we grow and we utilise. It's just, um, it, it comes well before the cattle or anything else. In our case, we choose to use natural grasses and where they grow. They're um, basically the cheapest and uh, I'll just try this thing again. That's sort of the same type of thing. Um, We've got no objection to introduce species if they uh, produce more, but we're not introducing anything actually. We've, we have flown in a few uh, um, uh, legume type plants onto our black country, but uh, generally speaking, we don't know whether they grow or they don't grow there. That, that's a bit experimental. Go for a bit of water. Um, so, as I said, the focus of our business is, is grass and, uh, and the real thing is how we manage that grass. And like everyone else that's been here today, perennial grasses are just the mainstay of our business. They grow the most bulk, they have the deepest roots and they utilise more moisture and, and nutrients. And uh, so there's no sort of rocket science in which one's the best to have. Be that said, it, um, annual grasses still make up a, an important part of our diet and, uh, and tree fodder in the, any of the, of the country that's got timber on is um, also a major part of the diet. CSIRO have done um, tests on country next door to us and, uh, and they're um, doing gut samples of, of cattle out there and uh, 50... 56% of their stomach content was actually tree fodder. So trees are absolutely critical part of our operation. Um, I'm going to, have to slow down. I'm just to be finished if I'm not careful. And so basically, in, in our case, at the moment, we're just using cattle to um, convert the grass into a saleable product. In other areas, we've used sheep and we um, have actually used dairy cattle in other environments. But this whole thing is grass and uh, what we use to harvest it is a bit academic. It, um, it certainly wouldn't be using sheep where we are now. Unless, um, we, uh, the dingoes would be pretty interested. The most common damage that we can do to grass um, is to overgraze it which, um, and the other one is to overrest it. And uh, overgrazing, as you know, is related to the animals regrazing the plant before it's recovered from the last graze. And overresting is just allowing the plant to go ungrazed and die off and oxidise and, uh, and shade it so it can't photosynthesise and regrow. And both situations um, reduce the, the plant population and in turn the production, of course. So um, to run livestock on it, the most critical thing, of course, is water. And uh, 
I'll just give you a bit of an idea on what we've done there. We took over this place um, and that's, uh, that, that's basically the shape of it. It's, um, and those little blue spots are where, we've, where we're putting waters and they're tanks, they represent tanks. And, and the areas that don't have anything on them are basically where we've got fairly thick timber and we probably never go into that country at all. And so, um, so um, water's our main focus. We'll, um, I can, uh, it's, um, we put about 300 kilometres of, uh, of three inch or 75 mil poly pipe in the ground a year. We buried about 600 mils and we put those lines, as you can see on that map, there are, those grids are about four kilometres apart, the, um, the poly lines. And we put a 135,000 litre tank and troughs every four kilometres up that part. So um, we, uh, we have a bore per nine tanks. So um, we end up with quite a few bores. Most of the bores, most tanks, most of the tanks are filled by, uh, the bores are, are, uh, are backup bores in case anything goes with the runs there. So we actually only use one of the bores out of three on each line most of the time. But still, you've just got to have them there. If a bore breaks down in our country, it's probably 18 months before we get a drawer out there. So you just have got to have everything doubled up all the time. And... Um, it's um, so uh, the, in the real sense, a bore probably supplies 20 tanks. But, uh, there's no real pattern to it. The whole thing is actually opened up, capable of you know water. Some water we know is moving 30 and 40 k's, and um, if you uh, that doesn't worry us. It, if it, particularly if it's got a gradient going the right way, but. Um, we do have the ability to shut it down so we know where water's coming from. And um, I'll just, that's basically how we shift the poly about. It's, um, we put 36 k's on a road train and uh, a, a poly. They're one kilometre coils. And um, it's, uh, for burying it, we use a D10 with a bit of a homemade spinner. And if you can look in there, you can see a bloke sitting just in front of that coil of poly and he's literally checking it all the way. And he's got communication with the driver in the, in the um, tractor. The first thing is the tractor goes up there. You can't see it in the background of that, but there is a, um, a uh, Komatsu 475 in there, which is a sort of 110... 110... Um, ton machine with a 40 foot rake on it and it's got a GPS set up on it and just drives in a straight line and we usually make those lines 40 k's north south and then we move over 4 k's and then come back and so the the, um, the Komatsu goes up and, and clears the line in the first instance and uh, and it does that pretty easy because it's got a, um, plenty of power. Then the grader comes along behind and uh, it sort of clears that out so we can get trucks up it and, and, um, and then we do fence along it eventually. And then the D10 comes along and, um, and we spin the poly out. We actually put most of it out at night and usually we'll put out 20 k's a night. So um, it, it's a pretty daunting sort of job when you look at it in the basic sense, but in actual fact, once you get your act together, it, you, can, um, you can put it together fairly well. We have a contractor that um, builds our tanks, um, and that erects the tanks. We actually uh, design the tanks and we get them built by a bloke about 150 k's from Adelaide. And uh, he manufactures them down there and, and we just um, bring them up and, and then we have a contractor that stands them up in the paddock. A tank like that uh, erected, we pay um, eight and a half thousand bucks for the tank and uh, he gets three and a half grand to erect it and, and plumb it up to the troughs and bits and pieces. 
Normally we'd put four troughs to a tank and uh, so a big mob of cattle can hit it. And, um, or the tanks are in corners, so one, one trough's in each corner, of course. And um, so uh, it's, um, it's all pretty simple when it's all boiled down. The most um, critical thing that we find is the, the distance to water, just how far can cattle walk? And, and you know, this would be the biggest debate in the north, you could imagine. And um, plenty of people have bred cattle that can walk 10 k's. And um, I don't know, Jenny Craig wouldn't have, uh, well, that's not the way you'd go about it, I don't think, because um, you certainly keep their figures in pretty good order. We find that we can get cattle to walk about two k's max. And in actual fact, I'd, I'd chop that down now. And, uh, and there's some pretty good evidence out there. The CSIRO have got a lot of cattle tagged and, and, um, and they've got satellite gadgets on them. And they're identifying that they're walking out. They're, they're spending 80% of their time within one k of water. So their preference is, is not to walk 10 k's anyway. And, uh, I'll just, that's a tank and trough situation and um, the dog's in charge. We actually now use um, concrete troughs, but uh, it doesn't make any difference which one you use really. And um, if you sort of look down that line, you can see another tank, tank off into the distance. And, um, and so, you know, that's how that whole system fall, goes together. The, what I'm going through now is how we've sort of established the distance to water because it, it's probably one of the most critical parts of our operation or, or making it work and then keeping the grass in order. That's, a, um, that's an old bore, that's a, you know, a traditional bore. I'm standing right at the bore, it's sort of right behind me where I've taken that photo and you can see out there for about a kilometre and there's not one vestige of perennial species left. And um, now that, that country would have been running around about 500 head of cattle on a set stock basis. So um, it shows you the damage you can do. You can absolutely annihilate the country. And it's a good point to take in because if you put waters all over the place, you can actually destroy the entire place if you just decided to set stock them and put the numbers on. So we do enter into some pretty dangerous territory if we don't run it properly. Um, that's going out about one kilometre from the bore, or not one, it, it, it is accurately one kilometre from the bore, it's done in a vehicle, and you can see there's a vestige of um, perennial species starting to appear, but uh, those cattle are doing a pretty good start before they get out there, and, um, and if you're a cow with a newborn calf, that's a pretty tough stroll on a hot day, you know, in, in high temperatures. At uh, two k's from the bore, you can see um, there's certainly a bit of perennial grass is starting to turn up and, um, and you can imagine those cattle have done it tough enough and when we say, you know, we walk our cattle out two k's from the water, we're putting a fair bit of acid on them to make that because they would be, um, if, if, you've, if you've got them on a set stock basis, they're doing it very tough. That, that photo is taken at three k's from the bore and that same board, and you can know that those cattle back at 1k were starving to death, at 2k's they were just getting a feed, and at 3k's there's no indication of cattle getting out there at all. So the, the theory that cattle walk big distances, um, we certainly can't substantiate anyway. And uh, we'll, um, um, I won't enter into that argument, but it is, it, it is probably the biggest a difference we'd have with um, a lot of opinion in the north anyway on distance to water. And, and don't worry, there's some pretty respectable blokes <coughs> arguing pretty strongly for that. But, uh, good luck to them. It costs us about three k's a head, per, three dollars per head per annum for diesel, uh, for delivery, delivery of the diesel, and for maintenance on pumps and water. So, um, and that includes the wages of a bormen. Our Borman is the most critical bloke on the place and, um, because he sees more cattle and more action than anyone else. We all, um, 
um, you know, fly around choppers and do all sorts of other things. But this bloke drives around, he sees the cattle and, uh, and basically he, you know, he's the most selected bloke on the place. And he turns up in the um, beginning of May because it's too wet to do anything through the wet season. We don't need a Borman through that period. And you, anyway, you couldn't drive a vehicle up there if you tried at the moment. And um, he stays there till the beginning of November. And um, he and then that heads off. And but you know you just can't you can't uh, overemphasise the critical job that that bloke does. I think he's probably the most important man on the place. Normally, most nights he would report to us and say what he's seen. Um, or we all sit around and have a beer and he sort of mentions it in passing, but um, it is critical. You know, that's how we get our, our information, quite frankly. And it comes from a Borman and it sort of sounds funny because quite often you'll, um, you'll go into town and get an old drunk and make him a Borman. And uh, he's actually the most vital bloke you've got. Anyway. Um, and, but, you know, water is cheap. It just, you can't believe if you, you know, if you... We do know the facts and we do keep a real figure on that, that uh, it's three bucks a head to water a beast in that country and it is just that damn cheap that it's a joke. So getting your waters right is just so critical. Each water point, as I said, is, um, is affects about 1,600 hectares um, because they're in four by four blocks. It's... Um, that it just happens to be 1,600 hectares or 4,000 acres of country. And so we put the equivalent of about 200 animal equivalents to a water. And uh, an animal equivalent to us, which I don't know, you use another term down here, maybe LSU or something else, but it's about a 450 kilo animal. And um, so there's one per eight hectares on that basis or uh, 20 acres to a, an area. And a breeding cow we consider to be uh, 1.5. And um, we leave about 20% of the boars in reserve that we ignore them, basically on the, uh, to cope with dry seasons. And uh, we don't take them in. So when we've completed this whole project, um, we'll have 600 tanks and, and watering sites, of which we'll only ever budget on 500 so there's always that gap up our sleeve that copes with seasonal factors and uh, breakdowns and anything else just you've got to have um, you've just got to have a margin on all these things a water point with the fencing that goes around it um, sorry It cost us around about 60 grand. It's, um, the tank and troughs probably uh, cost around about 20 grand. We chuck about $5 towards the cost of the bore per tank and because uh, they cost about 50 grand, uh, a, a borer that is, to put a bore down. And um, so it works out about 300 to 350 bucks, an animal equivalent to, uh, to develop um, the land. It's pretty good value because uh, an, animal, uh, an animal area out there is worth more than that. So it's much better to go and, and develop the land you've got than to go and buy the next door neighbours out if it's undeveloped. And um, so as I say, we've, so far we've put 560 of these water points in and uh, we intend to put 600 in in the first instance anyway. Um, so we've got 40 to go, so we're on the home run. We aim to run about 100,000 cattle and we're running at about 80,000 right at the moment. <clears throat> and basically they're built up from um, our original herd. We, introducing cattle is really hard work in that country. It's uh, hard to get them. All you get is other people's culls. And um, so you're actually on your own and you've just got to let that happen. But, um, so um, we are developing uh, 
control grazing. We're far from experts on it, and we're on we're in a new um, territory. We over the last 40 years we've always been into one form or the other of rotational grazing for varying reasons, and uh, and we're absolute converts. But we're in we're in different country out there, and you've just got to sort of go into it. Um, a little bit carefully. We've got, um, I'll just give you a bit of an idea what we've got. We've got um, three different systems up and running at the moment. One's a 40 paddock with a 400 hectare system, um, which is 1,000 acres. Another one's a 20 paddock system, which is 1,000 hectares. And another one's a 50 paddock system with 1,600 hectares. And we run about 5,000 animal equivalents to a mob. You can see on that um, slide there that that's in, a, in the system where we run, um, um, there's um, 40 paddocks of about 1,000 acres in that. They've already done one lap in that and that was done through the wet so it regrows again. And uh, we'd, um, we work on 5,000 AEs for that area. so. They're young bulls, they go in there at about 250 kilos, so we'd put 8,000 in that. Last year was a dry year, so we cut that back to 5,000. And, um, and you'll be surprised, you know, there's, you can see this paddock that's uh, closest to us that, that's had its second graze. Because we're going in three day grazes, it takes us 120 days to go round, and we do three laps of it. And so the first paddock has uh, had two bites out of it, and so they're going to come back over that and, um, and have a third bite. So there's their next meal. And um, it's amazing. They, it looks pretty plain right at the moment, and we're not getting enough stock density and all sorts of things aren't going right. But the next time they come over that, it's clean and, and uh, it won't have had any rain on it um, normally. But they do quite well, even though it looks, it looks pretty eaten out at the moment. And you can see the paddock they're going into, it's got a, a fair body of flag on it. And, um, um, and the plant population is definitely increasing there. And we don't um, do the measuring of any of that. It's done by the DPI. And uh, we've, we're going up, we're positive on all, in, in both flora and fauna. And uh, we've had an increase and it's a bit hard because they've been at it for three years measuring and um, we've got an increase of around about 6% in, in viable plant, uh, perennial plant population. So we do know we're not knocking it about and, um, and we've got exactly the same um, fauna population, lizards and spiders and things like that. They haven't varied at all. So we... Um, we're not stomping on them too hard either. And, you know, we went through a fair bit of flack, I might add, with the department on this when we kicked it off. They said we were going to destroy the entire show. And they're very enthusiastic and real converts now. And that's a terrific change for us. The other... Um, I'll just go to another one. That's just the thing on a, on a slower rotation, so you can see that's sort of... That's basically blue, what we call bluegrass country. I, um, we call it Queensland bluegrass. Queensland is probably called Northern Territory, but um, <laughs> it's, uh, we're not quite sure what it is, to be quite honest, but it's bluegrass in colour, so that'll do. And you can see that we eat that country down pretty hard, and they're in a fairly slow rotation, those, those sort of cattle, and, um, and they'll move into that, that green country. But, uh, and we've probably gone a little bit hard on that. Um, the next one just is... Uh, the controlled grazing against the set stocking. We've used our for all neighbours fence as a uh, measuring stick. They, um, they're, that's a big paddock and they've got that set stocked and you can see they're just not eating. That's, this photo's taken in January and um, uh, they're just not eating the feed that they're leaving at behind. And, uh, and there's no money in leaving it there because half the time it'll go up in smoke if you don't eat it. And, um, and you can see on the, uh, uh, the other side that, you know, that's fairly good fresh feed coming up. And uh, if I was a cow, I know which one I'd rather live in. But um, 
I'll, uh, I'll just keep going. We, um, we don't move them at all when we're carving, so this, uh, our carving's on from um, October, November, December, and so um, we've never been able to move cattle and not miss mother calves, so we just throw the gates on them and, and, and give them um, a series of paddocks. And then as soon as they've finished carving, which is about around about this time, we just start jamming them together and they, they get into it. I will say that we're in the early stages of, um, of all this um, grazing out on this sort of what is monsoonally influenced country. We've got four months where we've got a very wet system and very high humidity. And then we've got eight months where we've got virtually, nearly can guarantee no rain. And uh, it's very different from anything we've ever used before. So um, um, we're not making too many large statements yet. We need a fair bit more information. And, uh, but at least we're getting, we're going down the path and whatever we've done so far, we're pretty pleased with. So. Uh, I, I can't imagine a situation where we would back off and go back to, back to set stocking for all sorts of reasons and, and probably the, one of the biggest ones is it's so much easier to run a control system than it is to run set stocking. You know, our paddocks were big when we started there. It was sort of basically open country and, uh, and a, you know, the paddock we're cutting up at the moment is half a million acres and uh, it's... Um, any suggestion that you go out and muster it or have any control over cattle or go and get bulls in or do anything else is a joke. We, we're much a, we're muster a corner of it and jam them in the yard and work them as fast as we can. And you know, the maximum we can hold them in the yard is three days before we start perishing them a bit. And it's just, a, it just there's no way on earth it can work. And then you tip them back out into that paddock and go and get another mob, which you'll find, you know, a big chunk of the ones you've already just handled it come back in again. It's a pathetic situation. Um, everything's done, all, all stock work and mustering we do with helicopters and that's just us. We've just had them for 30 years and, and uh, some people like them, some people don't. The, the, the general rule of country up there is run with helicopters and uh, helicopters and horses and helicopters and bikes. In our case, it's just helicopters, and um, and we find them pretty cheap. It costs us about 200 bucks an hour to run a chopper, and uh, if you work that out, it's um, and that takes in its fuel, its maintenance, and its lease payments because we lease them, and um, so um, we reckon they're good value. It works out about six bucks a head for us to be shifting cattle. And that includes, if you've got them in a rotation, of course, you've done your mustering as well. So um, also, while you're doing it, you don't waste too much time. You always, we fly a different line of tanks and, uh, and do a lot of our checking from the air, which is um, because, you know, the Borman doesn't go to every tank. A lot of tanks have probably, um, no one's ever been to on the ground again since they were put in. And, uh, so the helicopter is absolutely vital to that. Our experience in other areas with, um, is that rotations increase the utilisation of grass, and certainly increase the density of it and the volume, and um, don't anticipate anything to vary from that, quite frankly, um, out there, even though it is a different environment to what we worked before. And as I say, the Department of Primary Industries in Darwin and uh, the Barclay Landcare Group, they've, um, they've got grants to uh, do all the measuring of both flora and fauna. And, um, and that's a terrific advantage for us because we're building up some independent positive knowledge. And, and we needed that because um, we copped a bit of flack up front when this started. It, it, uh, so down here where you're sort of so used to it, it um, you're, um, you're probably surprised, but it, it really was almost aggressive that uh, how people felt towards it and pretty challenging. 
The difficulty, of course, with, with set stocking is the cattle tend to just flog an area and, and they live around the water and, and uh, we'd, we'd annihilate the place if we, um, if we didn't. Uh, if we didn't have control of the cattle now. Um, we just have to have the ability to spell country. And um, anyway, I'm talking to the converted, so you know what I'm talking about. It's, once it's fully watered, we've just got to be, have that ability to, to spell it. I'll um, just come up with some slides which are more pictorial than anything else, but uh, what... Um, We'd work a mob of cattle, that's a typical set of yards we use. Um, there'd be 1,200 cows in that mob and their, and their uh, siblings and followers. It's, um, we run those mobs in, in 5,000 um, cattle units and so that, that works out as far as cows go, about 3,600. And, uh, so to bring those cattle into the yards and divide them up, we, we have paddocks beside the yards which have three tanks in them. And so they'll come in a couple of days before, go into that paddock, they split themselves up so they mother up, and then we just go to a tank and we pick up one of these mobs, jam them in the yard, and, uh, and work them. The first day's working on those cattle is, uh, is basically drafting them. We pull the weaners off. You can see them starting to go to one side. We pull off the, um, the wet cows because she's the valuable one, that cow that's had a calf, and whether she's back in calf again, and, uh, and she's critical to us. The, uh, the other ones are the cows that haven't had a calf, and they'll go off, and they'll be fat cows, of course, because they haven't reared a calf. And uh, in the, um, when you've got your cattle numbers up, of course you'd sell that cow, the fat cow, and get rid of her. We can't afford to do that. We just, we're trying to build up numbers at the moment. And so we'll tolerate a cow that has a calf every 18 months. And um, because we just, we'd slaughter our herd if we uh, didn't, we'd just never make progress. We just don't keep any progeny out of a cow that um, hasn't had a calf the year before. And um, so uh, that's our sort of funny little culling system. Um, that's uh, there. Uh, we don't castrate any cattle. All our cat, all our males leave us as bulls. Um, we run them in a mob of, uh, depending on the season. They, you know, what what goes into a paddock is really driven by the amount of rainfall we get. And in this year, they um, those cattle running there. They, they we run them through till they're about uh, 350 kilos, and they go to Japan uh, to uh, Indonesia. Generally speaking, as bulls. We get a premium of about 15 cents on bulls and um, it's, uh, um, I, I'm always mystified why people cut the nuts out of cattle in our country, but anyway. It costs us about 60 bucks a head to castrate a beast and, and we've done the numbers that often, it doesn't matter. But it's a, a tradition is a pretty hard thing to break. So those cattle that in, the, in that photo are just standing there, they're, they're in a rotation. Um, the next one is, they're the same cattle, but they're sort of being moved ready. We'll go out with the chopper and bring them up. There's two gates in that paddock, so half the mob will be at one gate and half the other. We make them stand at the gate there for probably five minutes till they, um, um, you know, they know that we're in control. We just never let them walk through a gate. They get terribly quiet. And that's critical to us because, you know, it's um, reasonably exciting if you put 8,000 bulls in a mob and um, you've got to get in the yard with them if you haven't got them in order. And uh, particularly Brahmins, they're pretty agile. They're not, they're not worse cattle, they're good, quiet cattle actually. But you've got to, um, you've really got to get any stress out of them and get them. And, you know, it is interesting, you can see a, this red beast standing at the, right up near the gate, you can't quite see the gate because I missed him in the photo, but um, that beast just literally goes through the gate first every time. Nothing will go through ahead of him. And, uh, and if you don't pat him, he just comes around behind you and, and rubs you up backside. And that's how quiet they get. And, and uh, the, um, 
they'll go through and that's that's our first draft of cattle taken off those cattle there weigh around about 350 kilos and um, and they're getting ready to uh, to get trucked off the place and go off to Indonesia we um, we take them to Catherine where they're weighed which is about 450 k's from us and that's where we part with ownership over the scales at Catherine um, they would just weigh the road train and so and tear it off and so that's how all that works. It's pretty simple. And um, then they go to uh, Indonesia. We've got basically three clients in Indonesia that take all our cattle. And, um, and we sent the first cattle to them in 1990. So they're getting to know us and we know them pretty well. And, and they're, they're bloody good operators. Um, you can't believe how offended those people were when they were challenged over this whole live weight, uh, over this cattle handling thing, because a lot of them um, are very professional. The, if the feedlots in Indonesia are far better than any feedlots I've ever seen in Australia, the ones we go to anyway. I'm sure there's some ones out there which are absolute shockers. And interestingly, the abattoirs, that, um, if I was uh, going to get my head cut off and I was a cow, I'd certainly go to Indonesia rather than Australia. And, um, and so there's, there's our cattle. You can actually see them standing over with our brand on an earmark. And that's those cattle that you saw before. They've been in that feedlot for 104 days then. And um, they're, ready to, uh, they're ready to go to slaughter. And uh, they're very professional. They can feed them for about a third of the price we can feed them over here. All their, um, most of their feed stuff is, uh, is um, uh, you know, waste product. It's a lot of palm oil, the palm you know, oil uh, crush or waste, whatever that is, or pineapple waste. And they feed um, green silage sorghum with it, which a local farmer will grow, and he um, and delivers it in on a uh, on his motorbike. It's um, it's worth looking at. You see these things coming down the road. They're just like bloody haystacks driving around. And in underneath it all is a, is a bloke on a bike. And it works incredibly well. And they're terribly good farmers. You know, the amount of corn they grow is, is mind-boggling. And, um, and we've been going to this particular feedlot here, which is owned by a bloke called... Oh, well, we call him Mr Tum. I don't know. His, I can't remember his real name, but um, it's Tum Feedlots. And uh, when we first started sending cattle there in the early 90s, Everyone lived in funny little houses which were sort of um, um, nearly, you know, they were matting looking houses and, uh, and life was pretty simple over there. Now all those people live in nice little brick homes, they've all got TV sets and, um, and you know, their standards have changed dramatically. They're, they've, uh, they're going pretty well. Those cattle in that feedlot are washed each day. Um, the clean, the feedlot itself is cleaned out. It's literally bagged. There's blokes come in there and, and wash that out. I, I've never seen feedlots as good as them. And um, so they're pretty good operators. And uh, and that's our main means of transport. And, uh, so um, that that sort of runs through on the on basically. Um, the uh, the picture show anyway the um, we target for our breeding herd the composition of our herd what we aim for is is about forty percent breeders we're trying to get to um, eighty percent plus carvings and we like to sell when we get there about thirty percent of the herd each year so they're all our let's call them KPIs or whatever you want to call them and um, it is achievable, we've done it before, we've had country in the Kimberleys and, and they're the sort of numbers you can get. So um, it's, uh, the critical thing is that, you know, you've got control of the nutrition, um, the fertility of both of the bulls and the females. And um, we've had a lot of trouble with our Brahmin bulls or with Brahmin bulls and, and um, Brahmins tend to have gone, certainly the Queensland Brahmins have tend to have gone very heavy on growth and they've produced a magnificent animal. But it's at, been at the price of fertility 
And uh, so we've backed off them. And in fact, all those type of bulls we've taken out of our herd now, and we're going for bulls that, that, that just have EVVs to support them. And, um, and probably a little bit more old fashioned type Brahmin, but uh, if you're not getting calves on the ground in our game, you're not in business. So it um, doesn't matter what you, they weigh, I can tell you, two calves are always better than one. And, and you probably, I don't know whether we're losing anything in weight, to be quite honest. I think we're getting our cow size down dramatically. We, our cows got up to about 600 kilos, and we're trying to get them down to about 450 kilos. So big, heavy cows are, are getting the axe. And, um, but not at the moment, because we're just too short of females. And uh, we've, um, we just can't afford to... Car but that's how you get these numbers up. For us to ever get to over 80% carvings, we've got to be pulling a big heap of our females out, as well as putting in the right genetics in the bulls. We don't use any supplements. Um, we've tried them. They certainly uh, increase productivity, but they certainly don't increase profits. And uh, we can't make money out of them anyway, so we don't use them. Um, maybe that's the country we're on, we can get away with it, I'm not sure. I know a lot of people up in the north do use supplements and, uh, and swear by them, and maybe they need them, but certainly on our country, we've, we found we can get away without them, and uh, <clears throat> it's a big factor. Um, probably the next area is the capital needed. I'm about to get hunted. I know. Um, that's good. I didn't want to talk about this part anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing is the physical development, getting the job done in equipment, and manpower and capital. And, but the, the, the biggest single thing in amongst all that is the delayed income by while you're building up your numbers and and just a sheer lack of dough going through there. And so we've, we've had to go out and get extra funds in from other places and, um, and you know, you can sort of run these things and develop them on a couple of ways. One is um, profits from the business. And I can tell you at the beginning, there's no profit, so that'd be a pretty fair, slow way to go. Um, you can go to the bankers and they're your first port of call and they've been great, but um, Make sure you pay their interest or they'll sell you up. They've got a business to run too, so. And then, we, so we've taken in a private investor who's a partner and he's taken, uh, he's not a partner actually, but he's a, he has what's known uh, as a convertible note. So he has the right to convert and become a partner in our business. And um, we've tried offshore um, fund managers and, and Australian fund managers and and none of them really want to come in till you're making dough and you've got a fair bit done. So, you know, we needed the money up front, not, not at the back end. Um, um, how am I going? I've got a little bit to... A I, I just um, give you a little rough run on how we started. We, we purchased the place at Canamble for 120 grand in, in 1966 and we borrowed 50% of that so we borrowed 60 grand off it and, uh, and by 1970 the whole thing was worth 60 grand so we were broke. And, um, but we always paid our interest to the bank. That was the one thing we stuck to and uh, it doesn't matter what you do you just got to pay that bloody interest and, and if you've got to sell whatever, make sure you pay the interest and you can hang in then longer. And um, we, uh, um, anyway, it, as I said before, that sort of gave us a little bit of a, uh, a system on how to work and um, we developed that property up. We, we not only did we um, get it up and running once we had it, got it developed, but uh, the bank actually offered us another place if we were prepared to pay the interest on that. And that was part of our growth. And, and, and we ended up with a second property out of that. And it's a good point because recessions or, or depression time, whatever you want to call them, are the greatest opportunity. It's the boom if you want to be careful of. They'll, uh, 
um, if any, any move you make in a boom wants to be get out rather than get in because uh, you only go down from there. And it, we're in a very cyclical industry. It just comes and goes. Anyway, in 1989, we purchased a property in the Kimberleys and we paid 2.2 and a quarter million bucks for it. And uh, it was running about 7,000 cattle. And we spent two and a half million on water. So, you know, the development is bigger than the, the original investment. And it, it's pretty... It, it's pretty daunting, that part of it. But it, that allowed that place to go up to run 20,000 head. It became very profitable. And, uh, and all, we, all we did to it was um, water it, get the fertility up, and the grazing control. There's no sort of rocket science in anything in doing that. And we sold that property and another one to buy the country in the Kimberleys. And... Um, so basically, I'll, I'll run through the numbers on that too. We uh, we paid 20 million bucks for the place in the Kimberley, in the place in the territory, and we shifted there because for a couple of reasons. One is it gave us expansion, and the kids wanted to do that. And um, what we got with it was 20,000 cattle and a, and a million odd hectares. That you know, we also what we got with it was the country that would run another 80,000 head and uh, all we had to do was tip the water into it. And um, it sounds, it's, it's, it all sounds pretty much in their telephone numbers, I know, and then we put sort of 600 waters into it, so you can, um, you know, that get rid of another 40 million bucks. So you can see why we, um, we bring in a bloke with a, a convertible note holder. And he's an Australian businessman and he's as happy as punch with it, and so are we. It's been a great situation. But what happens, he, um, if he wants to convert, he ends up owning 41% of the business. If he decides not to convert, well, um, we've got to pay him back in 2018. But probably by then, you know, the way we're going, we'll have our 100,000 cattle on the place then. It'll be um, pretty cost effective. It'll be profitable. And uh, all indications are it's worth more than 1,000 bucks an AE then. And so... We can probably put the dough together if um, if we can con our poor old unsuspecting bank manager to come again. But um, it is not for the faint-hearted. It's just um, <laughs> not everyone wants to play this game. And look, the greatest strength in our business is is the family. That's it. Uh, poor old Trish, she's moved um, to twelve different <laughs> houses over that period of time and, um, and had some beautiful houses. You had a lovely house up here at uh, Holbrook and we moved down to a miner's cottage on King Island. So, um, you know, it's not all beer and Skittles, but it works and that's what you've got to do. If you, you know, you've really got to throw your hand in. It's, um, if you're going to play this game, it's, uh, it, it's good fun, but it's, it is tough. I think that the most important thing we have here is that uh, that we remember that owning and managing land doesn't give us any right to, dest to destroy it. And it should be taken off us if we do that. It's, um, and then probably the only other thing I'll add to that is that it's got to suit your personality and your ambitions and your lifestyle. It's, uh, as I say, it's not for everyone what we've done. And, uh, but I'd do it again. But, uh, okay.